Okay. All right, Jerry, you should have it. Okay, let me pull up the presentation. And we've got your screen, so. Yes, sir. We're all set. Well, Jerry is go ahead, going ahead and uh, pulling up the presentation. Let me go ahead and uh, do an introduction here. Uh, my name is Mike DeLaCluse. I'm the president of uh, Lessman. I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to uh, join us for what is now our second customer webinar uh, covering, Lessman, uh, covering level instrumentation solutions for solids applications. Interestingly enough, both times we've scheduled these webinar uh, training sessions, we've had quite a bit of snow. Uh, so in the future, don't blame Lessman for all the snow we get here in the Chicago area. I'm just glad nobody had to commute uh, any further than their computer to, to see our presentation. Uh, we're honored today to have Jerry Bovera from Siemens as our presenter. Uh, Jerry's got 27 years of process instrumentation experience, just about all of it in level. He's worked for companies uh, such as Rosemont, Magnetrol, uh, L&J Technologies, Miltronics, and today Siemens. He's had various roles from application engineering, technical support, product marketing, and even sales management. Uh, Jerry's currently the product marketing manager for Radar uh, with Siemens in Grand Prairie, Texas, and he's been with Siemens for 12 years. Jerry, with that introduction, I'll go ahead and turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Mike. I guess that's, uh, that's one heck of an introduction there. I apologize for... Uh, for last minute, but we are here, and, and it is uh, uh, just about on time, maybe a little few minutes past. What I'm going to talk about this morning, and please feel free to uh, ask questions, and uh, I'll be glad to uh, take you through a, a response and an answer on this. We're going to talk about solids, uh, solid solutions uh, using uh, microwave radar technology. Uh, Siemens, formerly Miltronics, uh, with our division here, we, uh, we've got several different uh, products uh, to handle level. And uh, what we've got, before we get into that, let's talk about market share. If you look at the players within the uh, non-contacting radar market share for level applications, when you're talking about uh, uh, level applications, this is information sourced from uh, uh, a company called VDC, and it, just, it talks about uh, um, U.S. and Canada. You can see that Siemens has got 22 percent uh, market share uh, when it comes to non-contacting radar. When you dive into, and that's all that's all level, that's solids and liquids. When you look at the solids portion of the business the lion's share of the market share is dominated by us and that is because in January of uh, 2002 we launched the first microwave radar device, non-contact device that would measure solids, cement, fly ash, uh, powdered grains, things like that. But what we did was we launched it into uh, specifically the cement market. And so uh, we did lots of testing and, and such and validation to find a good successful design. If you look at this slide here uh, where it talks about the um, product portfolio for all the industries, primary industries for Siemens that we attack with our group is mining aggregate cement, uh, oil and gas, or HPI, oil and gas, chemical, and, and, and uh, power. If you look at the process instrumentation side, you can see we have circled there. We have ultrasonics, non-contact ultrasonics. We've got uh, microwave radar. We've got guided wave radar. We've got uh, different types of uh, point level switches, uh, vibration, capacitance, uh, paddle wheels and such. We also do flow, temperature, pressure, and then weighing and feeding products. So with that today, we're going to talk specifically about uh, the solids radar industry and how we serve it with, uh, with the technology, specifically talking about uh, radar. You can see that we've got uh, uh, mining, aggregate, uh, cement applications here uh, within the chemical industry. 
Solids radar could be used on plastic pellets, uh, uh, polypropylene, polyethylene. In the food and beverage side, that, that uh, industry would be the grains, the, the, the milling operations, flour, corn, wheat, hulls, things like that. And then in the glass industry, uh, specifically applications uh, on cullet and, uh, and glass and sand and things like that, uh, components that go into the manufacturing of, of glass materials. With the, uh, with the technology, and we'll talk a little bit about it, this, this product right here is our, our LR460. We've got two products uh, that have evolved from that uh, January 2002 product, which was the Citrans LR400. Product came out. It had a fixed flange. It didn't have an aiming capability. We found over you know a short period of time that you needed to have uh, aiming up to 30 degrees with that horn antenna because you've got materials that come into the silo or the bins or hoppers. They're either blown in pneumatically or they're dumped in, so they, they create angles of repose. You have to aim that horn. In the, uh, with the products that we have, the LR400 evolved to a product called the LR460. A lot more enhancements with processing and the mechanical side. And then uh, a couple of years back, we launched the two-wire version of the uh, LR460 called the LR260. So the 460 is a four-wire device, uh, which has a range capability of about 330 feet. The 260 will shoot out to uh, 100 feet as a two-wire design. And we'll talk, talk a little bit more about that. Looking at the applications here, you know, the, uh, even though we, we did a rifle shot approach into the cement industry and we, we probably hold the, that market share because of the installations involved in that industry, we really go into a lot of different applications for solids. So whether you're talking about grain, as you see, you know, we've got a grain silo on that, uh, within that picture to the uh, left of that LR460 is about a 320-foot silo that contains uh, grain. To the right, you've got lime dust, you've got gypsum, you've got uh, uh, asphalt down there. And the asphalt side, there's the liquid side and there's the solid side with the road mix and such. That's where the 460, 260 comes into play on measuring those 30, 40 foot tall silos. And keep in mind that in those applications where you have uh, uh, quite a bit of heat, we've done applications uh, at lime and gypsum plants like that on what's called the uh, lime cooler pocket level or a lime clinker where um, in the Chicago area it used to be Marblehead Lime, now it's called um, uh, Carmoose, and there are uh, places like that where they have clinker, line clinker coming out of a kiln at 1,500, 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit. As long as the temperature at the flange area is less than 400 degrees Fahrenheit, you're okay in that application. So you might extend the, uh, the antenna up inside a, a tall uh, and large diameter nozzle to do that measurement, but even though uh, you know we can do higher temperatures, we do applications within the steel industry and so on. And then when you look at that picture at the bottom there, poly polymeric powder, plastic pellets, plastic powders, uh, as I said, we, we accomplish those as well. We have all the approvals on that product. When you're looking at typical applications within the uh, microwave radar for solids applications, if you look at refineries, there's carbon, there's, there's, uh, there's very few applications there, but it's, it's mentionable to be named. But in the mining, uh, power generation, you know, in mining you're going to have uh, lots of applications with gold and ore and, and uh, rocks and things like that. Power generation is going to be predominantly coal, so it would be like a coal-fired power plant at Commonwealth Edison. Uh, consumer energy, places like that where you would be measuring uh, coal bunkers and such. Cement is something we've talked about. We, we deal in all realms of the cement market, all applications. Pulp and paper, uh, a little bit there. 
And then in grain, and, grain storage and bulk storage, we've really done a good job in starting to get into uh, uh, the companies, whether they're the milling operations um, or they're the, uh, the processing plants, like the Cargills and the uh, ADMs and such, where we're doing corn and wheats and grains and things like that. So if you look at the technology, Micro, microwave radar really came, has come a long ways with, with the technology in and of itself. It's come down uh, significantly in price. I mean, when I started out, uh, microwave radar devices were, you know, they were tank gauging, custody transfer accuracy, so one millimeter accuracy. They were liquids only designated, and they were up in the six, eight, ten, twelve thousand dollar range. Now devices you can get as low as less than $1,000 for a liquids type radar. And technology has come a long way with, with software and firmware where, you know, processing that signal coming back, keep in mind that with microwave energy, you're shooting at the speed of light. So you're, you're transmitting at a quick, very quick rate. And those signals that are coming back, you have to discern between you know, keep in mind when you're in a metal silo like that, microwave energy, unlike ultrasonics, microwave energy never, never uh, dissipates in time. So you don't get a lot of attenuation or absorption of that signal. So it just keeps on going and going, in so like that, kind of like the Energizer Bunny. And what happens is you have to discern all those spurious uh, signals coming back for the actual material level. And we do that with what's called process intelligence. We use different uh, algorithms, uh, whether it be a first algorithm or an area largest or best of largest first. We've taken the, the smarts from the, elect, uh, from the ultrasonics that we've done so for so many years, and we've harbored it into a microwave device that can actually deal with um, adversities like in a solids application, the biggest thing is dust in the airspace. You can, uh, you can imagine that when you're filling or you're emptying a silo of solids, you're going to have lots of dust in the airspace. You're going to, as you're filling, you're creating angles of repose. As you're emptying, you're, you're getting a inverted angles where you're drawing out at the center or off, the, off to the side. So these yeah, that, that was our problem with the uh, ultrasonics. Oh, was it? Yeah. Yeah, and, we're, and we're actually p replacing some of the ultrasonics that were our Miltronics. They're using okay. the DPL Plus. Right. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's a problem. And, and that's, it's interesting that, uh, that you make that comment because, you know, within our organization, you know, within this division, we have the ultrasonics and the radar. So on the solid side, we have you know, cannibalized a lot of these solids uh, uh, sales with the microwave radar because we've gone into those applications. And with, you know, ultrasonics is, it works great until you start filling and emptying at the same time or you're filling, you get that dust cloud and you, even if you're using a low frequency transducer, you still have a difficult time uh, exactly through. So, the microwave design, what it does is it, because you're sending out so many signals, you're essentially bombarding the airspace with so many signals at a high frequency that you're able to pass through those dust particulates and get a return echo. It, it, you know, we've proven it you know, with thousands of uh, units installed in very difficult applications. So solids is a difficult area to measure level and we've accomplished it quite nicely with uh, the 260 and the 460. With, you know, with every design that, that we manufacture, we obviously like to make it user-friendly for, for our, you know, you, our customers. So what we've done is we've incorporated, uh, you know, a couple different methods of, of configuration. You can do it with either the, the, the handheld that uh, is so well known from the ultrasonics, that little handheld calibrator. You can also do it with a software package, which we call Somatic PDM, uh, which is a uh, you know win Windows-based uh, system that uses a uh, you just install it, 
It's got a very user-friendly system so that when you, uh, you don't have to actually go to the unit to hook up your heart modem connection. If you have a heart device or a Profibus device, you just clamp onto the analog output. It can be in the uh, wiring area, uh, so down at ground level in a nice warm or cool area. And you can configure the unit. You can look at profiles and do all your diagnostics and your configuration with that. Or you can use a heart, a heart handheld for it. But there's a lot of information with the, uh, with the, that comes on the unit. A lot of troubleshooting uh, uh, things that if the problem, uh, if there is a problem, we can help you diagnose it. These, uh, these pictorials that you see or graphics that you see right there, this is just kind of a layout you know, within a cement plant. Just suffice it to say that there's a lot of applications that we can solve level with our, our radar devices. The continuous level on this slide here shows the ultrasonics. We still are, you know, selling ultrasonics into those applications, but we're, we're really converting a lot of people over to microwave radar. And with a, with a continuous level device, you see right here to the picture to the right where we talk about point level, we, you know, we encourage the use of a high level or low level switch uh, that's a different technology than the radar that can uh, be an overfill or underfill protection. And we've got the various technologies for, for those point levels. Uh, and then weighing and feeding products are a big area that we, uh, that we focus in on within uh, all the different solids applications. In this picture here, this is a, uh, this is raw material uh, at a cement plant where the LR262 wire radar has done a, a successful job uh, in this application. Very dusty. Not a real long range shot, but uh, uh, it can be a difficult measurement for us. When you're going into, you know, a, a homogenization silo where they're essentially blowing uh, air up to the surface level and, and sort of agitating it to do a blending process uh, <coughs> internally, you can imagine that that, uh, that that material level is light and fluffy. Well, the uh, the ultrasonics would typically pass through that level, whereas the radar can see that and give you a, a very nice uh, uh, measurement with high accuracy. You can see that to the left of the picture on that silo, to that upper left, you see that uh, the mounting. You've got the radar unit mounted. It's in a, uh, uh, I'll call it a top hat type assembly. And you have the situation where the horn is about 10 inches long, so as long as you're up inside there, only a few inches, you're, you're good with the mounting. You just have to make sure that you have the ability to aim the unit and not go in too tall of a standpipe. And that's where, you know, you, uh, Lessman can certainly help you with the installation and make sure that everything is correct in, the, uh, uh, in that situation so that you, have, you get a good measurement. Now in this, this picture here, this is a very narrow silo. You see a large silo uh, and then you, you see a small section there. Our unit is mounted in that section and you might think, well gee, how can you guide that signal down a narrow, narrow uh, aperture and not hit the sides and cause reflections from that? Well, when you look at the profile underneath the product there, you see that we're shooting out about uh, Oh, it looks like uh, about 40 meters, so that's quite a long shot, but you see a nice narrow peak there. What happens is we have what's called auto false echo suppression, where you can employ this on your measurements, and what it does is it, it maps out and learns all the obstructions, side ribs, bracings, uh, things like that that are along that sidewall. So microwave energy is, is very forgiving to False, false echoes, but once you employ that, uh, that technique of auto false echo suppression, it eliminates and gives you a nice clean signal. You can see on that profile the nice straight horizontal line until you get that peak. Uh, that's a, uh, a very clean shot in this application. Solids applications, once again, petroleum coke, it's hot, it's dusty, it can build up like that. What we do on the end of the horn 
when you look at the product picture here, what we have is we have uh, uh, essentially a um, right here, you can see that at the end of the horn, we put a Teflon dust cover that we mount on the end of it. It snaps on, and what it does is it eliminates uh, powder and collection inside that horn where you might have buildup and cause a, uh, uh, an erroneous reading to, to happen. This is the application that I talked about where you have a very hot material. You can see here where I have my, uh, my yellow arrow. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. That, you can see how hot that is. That material is very, very warm. And what we do is over on the right side of the picture where I put the arrow where the unit is mounted, we actually have a, a, a tall standoff with some insulation to keep the heat from coming to the emitter. Right, if you look at the product picture right here where I've got the, uh, the, the yellow arrow, you've got a Teflon emitter that's about the diameter and a pencil point like a, uh, like a pen. And if that material gets too hot, you start to soften that emitter and your propagation becomes difficult to launch. So what we do is we just isolate that, uh, ask the customer to isolate it. So this is a very hot process that is... Uh, uh, quite good with uh, these applications. And this is a more detailed picture of that installation. You see the unit mounted to the side of the, uh, the, the clinker cooler pocket where it's angled. This is mounted up here in a uh, 10-inch diameter nozzle so that you keep it away from that heat. More applications, you know, just showing the uh, uh, the picture above the product right here where you have my arrow showing, you can see the unit is actually buried in material and what, you know, the, it's a very robust design so it can handle uh, impact and, and things like that. Gypsum silos, gypsum is, is a very difficult material, it's light, airy, fluffy like that. Once again, we can do it uh, 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 nicely with the uh, with the radar product, and then we incorporate the point level devices as your high level overfill protection. You know they're they're a nominal fee. They're not you know they're anywhere from two to four hundred dollars, uh, depending on the extension and length. And it's a it's a reliable backup to make sure that if something does happen, you can stop the the conveying system or you can shut things down so that you don't have that spill that can occur. And you have, uh, you know, uh, money expended in cleanup and, and, and pots, possible uh, uh, damage uh, to the equipment. More uh, finished cement silos here, very tall, you know, 100, 200 foot silos uh, capable of measurement. This would be a coal, fly ash and coal applications here. Once again, you can see a very nice peak here. Uh, temperature is not too hot but uh, you see the mounting uh, in this, this particular situation. Asphalt is, uh, is a hot material. You know, it can be up to almost four, 450 degrees Fahrenheit, and coating and buildup is, is not a problem. So there's several, we've got a big install base in the, uh, the asphalt hot mix as well as the liquid side of the business with a different type of, uh, of product. Uh, lime dust. And uh, let me just mention a, a couple of things here uh, aside from applications. The, you know, Siemens, Siemens uh, formerly Miltronics, we're here in Grand Prairie, Texas. Uh, we support all the, uh, uh, the, the sales channel partners out there. Lessman is uh, one of our key, uh, key sales channel partners uh, in the U.S. Uh, we, we like to work uh, through them and with them on applications and support. So. We certainly have uh, uh, a good, reliable group with, uh, with Lessman. Uh, the, the radar devices are not, you know, honed in only to solids. We do liquids as well. And uh, you can see here that this is plastic pellets. Plastic pellets can be difficult because they're, uh, they're very low dielectric. 
and their reflectivity is, is not as strong as you would get with, let's say, water or cement or things like that. The LR260 works quite well in these applications. Uh, these are about 40 foot tall, uh, used, and these are used bins at a molding facility. Flour is a difficult application. Flour tends to build up uh, on things. We need the dust cover in this application. Uh, these uh, are collection, dust collection systems right here. You know, here's our unit mounted, and we're actually talking to it on top of the silo, which is not where we have to talk to it. But we're talking to it with our laptop via heart modem and connecting in and looking at profiles with that. Uh, further installations, you can see this picture right here uh, to the lower left. You've got lots of flour that's caked on the outside of the horn, but we don't care about that uh, because it, it only matters with the uh, aperture. We have a dust cover that's mounted on that, eliminating the material uh, coming in. Uh, that's the lower right picture is me <laughs> trying to get at the, uh, the unit and uh, take some pictures here. So with the, uh, any questions that you may have, um, this last slide is for uh, Mike's purpose. Uh, I do appreciate you taking the time to tune in uh, and talk about Solids Radar. If you have questions, please contact them, and Mike, I'll let you take over. All right, Jerry, thanks for your presentation. Um, does anybody have any specific questions at this point that, that they want to ask Jerry while we're on the phone? Uh, yes. Will that, his uh, uh, metering work for liquids as well? Uh, yes. Well, we have we have liquid radar devices that are specific for uh, uh, liquids. We have LR two hundred. We've got uh, you know all the products in the radar side are LR liquids radar. So there's the LR two sixty four sixty are designated for solids applications, and then the the two hundred, the two fifty, the probe LR. Depending on the application, uh, some are rod antennas, some are horn antennas. You know, they will fit into any liquids application. Right, yeah, I've, I've got a couple of applications, uh, one enclosed tank and one open tank for in a pre-treatment plant. Okay. Uh, we are using the Miltronics Hydro Rangers right now on them, and we have pretty good luck with them, you know, except for the, you know, we get, uh, especially in the enclosed tank, we get a lot of warm air coming in there in the wintertime, and that creates quite a bit of fog in there. I see. And we get a lot of false readings then. Right. How, how tall of a uh, uh, chamber is it? The tank is, uh, isn't tapered much at all. It's a, actually an old milk silo that we converted into a solids tank. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and, and you know, the, if you're dealing with heavy steam and things like that, uh, you, you would probably want to... Um, migrate towards the Citrans LR200 in that application. Right. So maybe keep that in mind and you can talk with the, 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 your Lessman uh, sales engineer on that. Right. The other question I have is uh, on the powder side of things that we're using in our plant, we're a food industry, and wondering if they, you make that in a uh, sanitary uh, fitting at all or a sanitary probe. No, the, the, the solids devices, uh, 260, 460, are, you know, they're, they're an ANSI flange. Uh, well, they're not an ANSI flange. They're, they're what's called a universal flange mounting. So it is a, it's, it's more or less a, about an 8-inch diameter plate that mounts either to a flange or to a silo ceiling, that type of thing. But there's, there's certainly areas of cracks and crevices where, you know, things could... Uh, <laughs> build up on it. Uh, how tall of a uh, uh, container are you talking about for this solids? Uh, it's not very tall at all. It's actually a, uh, a bin that we dump our auger, our powder into, and uh, we just need to know if it gets too high in there. And it's only probably, oh, two feet wide by three and a half, four feet tall. Okay, okay. We now, do, that, yeah, and, and what I was going to say was, uh, Mike, just for your information, you know, that you might keep in mind for, for the salesman that handles that particular area, the LG200, which is our guided wave radar, we can, we can apply a single rod on that with a sanitary tri-clamp connection 
that would, uh, if you don't have, you know, if you can go into this silo or bin, I should call it, uh, without any kind of uh, obstructions nearby, that would work actually quite nicely in this application. All right. So it's okay. contacting. It's contacting, but it'll give you a, a very reliable measurement. Oh yeah, in a situation like that where we you end up a probe coming into the side of the the bin or whatever, um, you can build up some powder on the probe, but it wouldn't actually measure the powder till it got up around it completely or sense. Well, it, in this application, you would mount it from the top down, so it would be in a vertical fashion. If you're just if you want to measure continuous level in that bin. If you're just looking for, you know, something to shut off when it gets to a certain high point, yes. then, then we have, we've got several different options that you can go with on point level alarms that'll shut it off. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else from anybody? Uh, that was no, Tim talking. Pardon? The, the last one talking about the sanitary application, that was Tim, right? Tim Johnson? Correct, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. This is Greg Ogan. Uh, it's two questions. One is I had uh, mentioned to uh, Mike about the uh, sizing the uh, 40, 20 milliamp cable, and you said that you had some information. So if you can email me that, uh, I'd appreciate it. And the other question is uh, I just bought uh, late last year, 09, three new Miltronics Easy Aimer kits for the ultrasonic probes. Uh, can you tell me if that works with the uh, LR460? Or no, is that a different? It, it's a different aimer. Uh, you know, the, there's not a, there's not a uh, let's call it a kit or a separate item that's it's like the ultrasonics where it's an easy aimer. With the radar, it basically comes uh, all, all in one. Okay. So you've got the horn that's mounted to the bottom of the, uh, the, the flange plate, let's call it, the universal uh, flange, and then you have your ball socket that's part of the mechanism. So it's more of an integral type design, you know? Okay. So I've got some easy aimers that I can use for something else or whatever. Yeah, yeah okay. exactly. All right. Anything else that I can uh, answer with regards to radar or anything else that we have? I have a question about uh, uh, electrical noise from frequency drives. Are the units uh, susceptible to that? or That's a very good question that we get quite often. And when you're talking about microwave radar, because of the frequency that they operate at, you can mount it right next to a VFD and not have an issue. You can, okay. Yeah, so uh, noise, you know, EMI, RFI noise is not something that will cause any kind of concern with a microwave device. And the other thing about microwave uh, devices is that they, they operate at such a wide bandwidth and a high frequency that you can mount these units, like we're talking about these solid units, you could mount several of them in a cluster and measure different, you know, high spots of angles repose within the same silo and never have any crosstalk. So whereas ultrasonics, you have to synchronize pulses if you've got the units in the same area, or you have susceptibility and noise problems, microwave energy is, uh, is much different. So it's impervious to those type of things. Okay. Well, I have an installation where as soon as my freak drive comes on, it, it maxes the signal out. So it's obviously coming in on my analog, not, on, not from the radar then. Okay. Is that something that uh, Mike, maybe Andy, could look at, or? Yeah, we can we can get Andy involved That's if we need right to. Now. Okay. Anything else? I sure do appreciate the questions and the uh, uh, the the attentiveness here. Sherry Brian Mills, uh, general question. Yes, Brian. Uh, I'm a farmer here in Illinois and have a. Uh, several bins I'm trying to monitor. And working with Lessman over the last couple, three years, uh, there's been some recommendations for the microwave radar and some recommendations for the, uh, the sonar. Okay. Do I hear you saying that 
in an application like that, you're kind of transitioning everyone from the uh, sonar over to the radar? Well, it, it depends, uh, Brian, it depends on the application. You know, I mean, if <coughs> certainly the ultrasonics, you know, will do, if they're, if they're silos that do not have a lot of activity, in other words, you know, they're, they're storage, you move there's, some of the There's always going to be dust. Okay, if there's going to be dust, what, how, how tall are these? Uh, 40 feet or less. Okay. If you're talking, you know, there's, there's a couple of things you can do. I mean, the ultrasonics, you can size the transducer and have a, higher, a lower frequency transducer to <coughs> compensate for that dust particulate to basically what it does is it blows through the dust. But the radar, the, the radar is designed to handle all ranges and it just does a it does a better job with reliability of not losing echo in those dusty shots like that. So, you know, we're I mean, certainly we have a, a promotional situation where we go out and we, we we call it trade up for performance, where we'll talk to a customer that's got ultrasonic devices and, you know, uh, trade up or talk to them about the radar. If it's a new installation, we really are talking more radar on solids than we are ultrasonics. And, and that's just kind of transitioned as the radar is becoming more... Uh... It, it's becoming more acceptable, uh, accepted in the, uh, the solids industry. You know, prices have come down. Now certainly, you know, if it's, a, if it's not a real long shot, you know, cost, uh, economies of scale, you might get away with it less expensive by going with, uh, you know, a, a, a multi or a, a, an LU01, like an SPL with a, a, a transducer that might be a, a 15 or 30 kilohertz type transducer, but it's going to be close. I mean, because the, the 260, you know, approaches that, uh, uh, you know, low $2,000 price, and the 460 is around 2800 somewhere in that neighborhood. So, you know, it's, it's not far off from the pricing. So if you can handle an application with a technology that's going to really um, deal with all adversities, that's the way customers are leaning towards. I mean, there's a big migration uh, towards and a following towards microwave radar and getting away from really a lot of other technologies. It really, Brian, Brian, when we look at these applications, we really try to fit the technology to the application as opposed to going in with, you know, we're going to sell this technology no matter what because in, in many cases, ultrasonic still works great and, and the cost is significantly less. So, you know, we, we try to look at it from uh, the application standpoint, not, not a technology standpoint. We, we really want to apply the right technology in the right spot. And, and that's, uh, Mike, that's what I was trying to get from Jerry is if, if there was a, uh, an application where ultrasonic would be preferable to the radar. Well, uh, I mean, let, yeah. let me see if I can give you an example. Uh, if you've got 10 bins that are all right next to each other mm -hmm. and they're all 40 foot and they're all not real dusty and it's solids, We'd probably go ultrasonics because we have a, a device that can have one piece of electronics and 10 transducers and, and bring the cost of doing those 10 bins down substantially compared to radar. And in our confidence in using ultrasonics versus radar in a 40-foot shot that's fairly low dust with solids would be really high. So, you know, there's no issue in applying the technology and, and the cost would be significantly less. So, Whereas with radar, and that's a very good example, Mike, with radar, you can't, you cannot multiplex like you can with the ultrasonic. Right. So you can bring 10 transducers to one electronics and cycle through each reading, whereas radar, you have to have the electronics mounted integrally to that antenna, that horn antenna. Okay. I'll, I'll give you another. I'll give you another example, uh, real quickly. One of the world's largest flour mills is is here in the Chicagoland area, and they had uh, 
50 bins that you know are all real close to each other. Uh, to do those 50 bins with radar uh, would certainly work, and it would work great. But what we did instead is we put in four uh, electronics boxes, each with 10 transducers to it, and the cost versus radar was is probably in the neighborhood of about a third. So uh, it, it, it just kind of depends on the application and what the environment's like and what you're trying to shoot. And, uh, it really depends. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, I have a question about the, uh, if you're inside of the bin or the silo with the, uh, the uh, radar running, should that be turned off for, for safety reasons or will it hurt, not hurt a person? No, it, uh, the energy that's, uh, that's emitted from uh, process radars or, or liquid radars or solids radars is on the order of, you know, tenths, very small amounts of tenths of milliwatts. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's much, you know what, uh, to put uh, it in perspective, your cell phone that you put to your ear has much more energy emitting into your <laughs> brain than what the microwave would ever do. And, and if, if that is a concern, you know, with the plant, the personnel, and that type of thing, we have a letter that, we ha that we've, uh, you know, gotten from our R&D facility that goes into a whole explanation and indicates the safety there. Okay. That, is a, that is a very good question, though. That comes up often. You can't cook some popcorn under it. <laughs> hey, Jerry, there was a question that was uh, entered on the chat tool yes, uh, sir. from Bob Green. It says, uh, what's the application that he has? A reactor up uh, baffles, liquid, and some foaming. Yep. I, I see that, and the answer to that would be um, using, <laughs> we'd have to get more data on it, but that, that would be a difficult application. It's not, not insurmountable, but definitely we would go with an LR200 on that. So if there's foam, you know, foam is an interesting uh, uh, adversity in that you can't really uh, quantify foam, so what, you, what we have to do is, we compare it to a couple of different things. Everybody, uh, you know, people like their beer. Beer, beer foam would be analogous to a, a, a closed cell structure, uh, very dense foam, where the microwave energy off a, off a uh, 6 gigahertz frequency would reflect off the top of that foam, as opposed to, let's say, your Colgate palm olive dishwashing detergent that you use in your sink that's a light airy foam. The signal will reflect through that foam and hit the liquid surface. So there's two different scenarios. And when you got you have foam, we sort of have to find out, you know, asking the customer what is it the consistency of, or what's it like, uh, in order to judge it. But anytime you're dealing with foam, with radar, the the operating frequencies on non-contact radar will range uh, in the industry. Anywhere from, they'll be either 6 gigahertz, they'll be 10, or they'll be in that 24 to 26 gigahertz fre frequency. As you go up in frequency, your size of your aperture that produces that microwave energy is smaller, your wavelength is smaller, uh, so you can deal with different adversities, but the lower frequency, that 6 gigahertz, is more conducive to things when you have foam in the application. So you want to use like an LR200 and, you know, baffles and agitators, things like that. The, the baffles, you have to watch out where you mount the unit, but the agitators, that can be taken care of with the auto false echo suppression that we, that we employ to ignore false obstructions. And it works very nicely. Well, this is Bob. Do you need to put like a Teflon film or cover over the bottom of the cone in it? No, in that, in that situation, Bob, we wouldn't put, uh, there, there are no covers that go on to the horn antennas. Um, you know, that's for dust. So in that situation, I mean, if you have splashing, if you have things like that, you, you really sort of have to mount the unit in a, in a, in a spot where it's not going to see splashing, if at all possible. And I mean, we can look at the application details in specifics uh, on this particular one. 
and, and get a little bit better recommendation. I'm just going by, you know, what it said, 200 PSI and baffles and agitators and foam. That's what I would lean towards, that LR200. Yeah, I that guess would, we've got one uh, radar unit. We're testing on it now or something. It kind of it works fairly well. depends on the level or so. Once the level gets up a little higher, it starts having some trouble. Well, how high are you bringing the level? Uh, well, it's 90% on the vessel. Okay, but how close in proximity is it to the antenna? It's, well, probably a foot from the bottom of the Yeah, and you, you might be, and, and you might be approaching the blanking or dead, you know, dead zone. Some people call it blanking, some people call it dead zone, blind space. If you're approaching that, then the, the, uh, the material level could look like it's further away than actually is. So, I mean, I, if you want, we can talk offline further about it. Okay. Anything else from anybody? Boy, it's been a, a good discussion on uh, questions. A quick question on uh, a dust buildup on the Teflon cover on the on the emitting horn. Yes, sir. What uh, at what point would would dust or or whatever buildup on there become a problem? How thick would it have to be? Or that that's another good question. The um, du the the I'm trying to think of the word. They, when you quanti when you when you consider the the quality of that dust, if it's a dry material, you know, dust. Most applications in the solids industry, most of them are low dielectric. You know, and, and your dielectric value, one is air, eighty is water. Okay, as you get into the lower dielectrics, let's say, you know, um, for all intents and purposes. Uh, dielectrics of two, three, and four, which are in the area that we talk about with cement and fly ash and coal and things like that. If it's a dry material and it adheres to the uh, to the dust cover, low dielectric dust is not an impact on it. I mean, I, I've seen material that was caked on that uh, that cover, you know, maybe an inch thick, and it doesn't pose a problem. The areas where you have to be concerned would be applications like lime, um, applications like flour that can potentially have some moisture, or uh, and it's hygroscopic. If you get some moisture and you get material that that clings like a buildup on that horn and uh, that dust cover, you could have a problem there. And I've seen it specifically in applications like lime. You know, where you've got a little bit of uh, buildup. When you open your hatch of a, uh, of a silo or a bin or a hopper, if you've got a lot of material caked on the inside of that, uh, you know, the manway or the roof of the silo and such, more times than none, it's going to have a situation where it's going gonna, it's gonna to cling to that dust cover. And in some cases, if it's a dry material, it'll blow through it. And sometimes we have to... You know, uh, the customer has to uh, do some type of PM or periodic maintenance and clean it off. Uh, the nice thing about the horn antenna is that, you know, it's a, it's a hunk of steel, machine steel, and, um, or I'm sorry, it's a cast aluminum, uh, uh, stain, it's, a, it's a stainless horn. So you can bang on it, uh, pr preferably with a, a, a rubber mallet, and you can knock the material off. But I've seen situations where, you know, customers have called and said, you know, my unit is locked in at a high level reading. My material is 10 feet away. You know, we send somebody out there or we, we get to talking over the phone and it comes to pass that, you know, there's a buildup on the end of the horn and it has to be cleaned. So, you know, the, the, the short answer to that is if it's, if it's a dry material that, that clings on it or from static, not a big problem, but if it adheres to it with, you know, a moisture cake like that, then you're going to get a, a bad reflection. Okay. That answers my question. Thank you very much. Sure. Anything else from anybody? Okay, Mike. I guess that's, oh, yep. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation, Jerry. Oh, uh, you're if very welcome. If anybody does have any specific application questions, feel free to give me a call. 
um, especially if you don't know your account rep. If you do know your, your account salesman, go, you can go ahead and call him directly. All the products that we talked about today are available and, and have all the specifications and all the information out on our website at uh, www.lessman.com. The other thing that we, we started a little while back, and later today you'll get an invitation, is a LinkedIn forum. Uh, this forum is a way for you to keep up to date on our upcoming webinars, as well as a place to uh, post questions and connect to some of the others that have attended seminars. Uh, when we schedule a new session, uh, LinkedIn will be one of the first places we post it, so you might want to give it a try. At this point, if there are no further questions, the uh, presentation will conclude. Thank you all very much for attending. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks okay. for your time. Okay. Have a good day. Mike? Thanks, Jerry. Mike? Yes. Okay. This is Greg with Malt Europe in Milwaukee. Yes. Yeah. Hi, just, Greg. just wanted to rem uh, remind you that um, um, uh, if you could uh, email me that information on the Belden cables. Yep, well, I'll look it up and uh, we'll get something off to you yet today. Super, super. Now, okay. you're with Lesman? Yes. Okay, you're not with uh, Siemens or Miltr Miltronics. Right. Okay, yep. that's right. fine. I just wanted to, to have that in my brain. Yeah, no, we've, we've, we've got all, you know, we've got access to all the same information. So once I look it up, we'll, we'll get it over to you. Okay, very good. All right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for attending. Bye. Bye.